Good afternoon uh, and welcome everybody to those of you who could join us in person. Uh, it's nice to see people actually in a room again for this type of event. And also the, to those of you who are joining us on Zoom online. I'm Kelly Loper. I'm the director of the LLM and Human Rights Program uh, at Hong Kong U. And I'm very pleased to be moderating this hybrid event, which is co-organized by the Asia Global Institute. Um, at Hong Kong U, the Center for Comparative and Public Law um, in the Faculty of Law, and also the Institute of Small and Micro States. And I'm really excited to introduce our presenters uh, for today who will be sharing their experience, their expertise, um, their insights on human rights, the Pacific Island or the Pacifica way. And the Pacific Islands um, are one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse regions on the planet. So we'll, we'll first be um, hearing from Petra Butler, who's joining us online. She's the professor at Victoria University of Wellington and the director of the Institute of Small and Micro States. Um, and then the, she'll be followed by Anna uh, Tukete, um, who is one of the Asia Global Institute 2023 Global Fellows. And Anna is an international lawyer and arbitrator who has been very involved and worked closely with the International Criminal Court. She's also the deputy director of the Institute of Small and Micro States and was awarded the Medal of Order of Fiji in 2017 for her work with Fijian women and youth. And we have limited time today um, and there's a lot to discuss. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to read out all of both of them very impressive uh, accomplishments and achievements, but I will now hand over to Petra to get the discussion started. Um, but for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, you can type your questions into the Q&A function um, and we will try to get them to them in the last part of the session. So thank you very much, um, Petra. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly, for this fantastic and really kind introduction. And thank you for having me in Hong Kong. Uh, would be nice to be there in person, but you know, it's great that we now have, we're very used to this technology, it was actually built all these bridges. Um, I'm going to start us off with more like, I thought, um, first of all, a little bit on the, if I can get, make this work, on the, um, on actually what the Institute is, and then like a quick broad brush introduction into human rights in the Pacific Islands and what is maybe different, what is challenging. And then for Anna to actually dive down uh, uh, in one particular issue, something we are really would like to work on from the Institute's perspective. Right, so, um, and then we, of course, we're looking forward to lots of questions and so we can have a lively discussion maybe. So the uh, Institute was actually founded at the end of 2018. Uh, so we just had one year before COVID hit. The aim was to be interdisciplinary, but also actually provide a platform where small states or the small state community, the stakeholders could come and discuss issues uh, and then help them along with some advice and by providing this platform to actually have some discourse about some of the issues which are very pertinent for small states. And uh, that has led to quite a good number of projects. We have partnered in, in particular with the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, you're probably all familiar with, but we also had actually funding from the German government. We had uh, funding from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. We had funding, um, we have done some work with the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, and you can see there's all sorts all sorts of different projects. Um, I think very importantly, we run for the this year for the eighth year, uh, a small states conference, which is kind of our signature event, uh, bringing together all these different stakeholders. So from trying to get a representation from all small states around the world, uh, getting everybody there from a lawyer to academics to NGOs and other state civil society. And we're doing that with Beckel and Wilma Hale. This is Wilma Hale is London's office, which they normally do mostly international dispute resolution. But that is really important because this is where Anne and I actually met for various stuff, doing different things. Um, so that is basically us. Now, 
these are just the small island developing states, but I thought before I just have another slide, the next slide about the Pacific Islands, I do think it is quite important to picture where our small states actually are. And these are just the island states. So you have one cluster uh, in the Pacific and you have the other one in the Caribbean. There is a couple, um, of course, in, in Africa and Iceland really right on top there on the top of Europe also as a small state, not developing though. There are a couple of other, you know, land, land uh, locked or uh, land um, mass small states as well, like Qatar, for example, or Namibia or Botswana. Um, Malta uh, is another island state in the Euro in Europe, Liechtenstein. So there, there are uh, Bhutan, there are other ones. But just gives this gives you a little bit of an idea because one of the questions we might be able to discuss is what is the difference between the Caribbean and actually the Pacific. So now I'll have a look at the Pacific. And that is something Kelly mentioned already. It is one of the most ethnically diverse regions of the world despite being, you know, all being small island states. Um, and we have states like Tuvalu, Nauru and Nui, which have around, say, 10, 20,000 citizens. So it's really small. Um, there are three different, if you want, large ethnic groups. You know, you divide up the Pacific Islands in Polynesia, Melanesia and Micronesia. And there are differences, you know, it's, uh, I think that is something to really remember when we're talking about the Pacific. I mean, we're talking about Europe, but of course the French and the Germans, uh, I can tell you their thousand years of war fought because they are so different and the EU, you know, um, the existence of the EU is because of the difference between the French and the Germans. So it is, even though they are have lots in common, like the Europeans have, they are their own group, their own uh, state and their own, you know, have their own culture. So I think that's something which I think we really need to re remind ourselves, even though we talk globally talk about the Pacific Islands. Um, the other thing is we're always talking about the Pacific Islands as small states. However, I mean, we know from international law about the exclu exclusive economic zone and the exclusive economic zone in the Pacific is larger than Europe. So one way to look at it is not to talk about small island states, but actually talk about large ocean states, uh, which might be quite a nicer way of, you know, putting it. But it has then, it also signifies in one sense some of the issues that arise. So that's just giving you quite quite a little bit of an, an idea. Um, just to maybe who has not been there, it takes about 12 hours to fly from Hong Kong to Auckland. Uh, so you know, and it's basically 24 hours away from Europe. So it is really a little bit at the bottom of the world. So roughly that was kind of the New Zealand, but it's not, it can take, this is another kind of slide I don't have, but I just remember just to give you some idea about distance is um, to get from Guam, so from Micronesia to actually Samoa, takes often three to five days because of the way the flights are, the distance you need. So it's it's a relatively remote, even within the Pacific, hard to fly around. And in some, some little islands, you only can get by boat. Right, so now talking about human rights. And I think one thing, so I, I just did this, um, uh, uh, so that's relatively updated uh, about, so the first thing, of course, we look very positivistically is what kind of international core instruments, which one of the core instruments did those Pacific Islands actually sign? And Fiji is the only one, and that's one of the only ones in the world that actually signed all nine, uh, or one of the few that signed all nine core international human rights instruments. And other what you see is relatively patchy. And what is really interesting is the that the ICSCA and ICCPR, which we normally would say is are the, the core, the core of the core instruments, um have not gotten the reception you would you would think. What has been signed basically by everybody is the Rights of the Child Convention in the in CEDAW. 
overall, I think when you look at it and take a step back, is that the conventions that have a communal element and are not so individualistic, don't you know, um, emphasize in the individual rights, but rather communal rights have had a better reception in the Pacific than, um, than conventions like the ICC PAR, so conventions that are indi very individualistic. One convention that is not a human rights convention as such, but actually very important, is the event convention against, uh, against corruption, which all all of the Pacific Islands listed here have signed. So that got a, that got quite a big reception. Another uh, measure, of course, is looking at national human rights institutions. Fiji, Samoa, and Tuvalu have one. Samoa is the only one in the Pacific Islands that actually um, is Paris principle compliant. Um, so even those, you know, so that goes to the international human rights compliance. Some of the other islands actually have an ombudsman office that takes some of the functions of um, of the human rights rights commissions. Right then, having a look at some of the indicators. So if you look at the quality of life, and this is done by the, uh, this is a new, relatively new think tank, the human rights, um, they're doing basically quali quanti qualitative, quantitative analysis. And uh, you can see that if you have an income adjusted, so you actually look at 100% as what a country actually can achieve, given their GDP and their overall, their overall uh, setup that, uh, and I couldn't quite choose the country, so that's the ones they have actually looked at, but there is some overlap at the other countries we looked at. You see that some of those small island states like Vanuatu and uh, Kiribati are actually quite good in regard to the quality of life, so from what they can achieve if it's income adjusted. They are setting by 83%, and if you if you compare this with Australia, you know, even Australia only makes eighty-eight percent. So there is basically not a not a hundred percent in any of any of those states. But now looking at the health children and look at the global best, then it looks a little bit different. Um, uh, but again, also Australia in comparison to everybody else at the global best, again, only not at 100% at 88. And Vanuatu and Kiribati still do really well, even in comparison to the global best. Yeah. So we do have, despite maybe a lack of signing up to um, Inter interna international international covenants, human rights covenants, and the lack of human rights commissions. When you do the metrics, the metrics aren't, they're not fantastic in like in Tuvalu and Samoa and so on, but they're also, they could be a lot, lot, a lot worse. So it's a little bit like as your glass half full or half empty. I'm more the glass half full person. So I, I actually think um, it is, quite it is quite quite uh positive now we also can take a step back and actually think about why some of the um countries have not signed up to these international uh conventions because if you look at this you would say why not you're fulfilling some of the aim of those conventions core conventions already now I said before that some of them, like Tuvalu, are looking at 20,000 citizens. Um, even I think Samoa at the moment sits maybe on 200,000 uh, citizens. And the answer is actually relatively easy. It is one of capacity. Um, so for because those international um, human rights convention have reporting mechanisms attached to them. So somebody at one point needs, if you really meaningfully want to take part in the human rights community, needs to sit down and write a report about your human rights compliance. Now, if you, I think Tuvalu the last time we looked 
had exactly one lawyer, also one private lawyer. They are a couple in government, but basically they're sitting on one lawyer. Yeah, so there might be three, four in government, and then one, 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 one private lawyer. So, so basically, the the government lawyers, the government is so small that actually it is a luxury to sit down and write a report, unless you get outside funding. It, but then you need to often also get some consultant coming coming in and and often that is it's not worse that's nearly more complicated than actually doing it yourself so that actually has prevented that has always been one argument argument to not sign up and i think that is definitely something to to think to think about right um so the other thing I, I thought I wanted to now talk about to set it up for Anna to take over is actually to look at, so I call it Cafe Paradiso and the N NGO's preferred hub. So one thing I've noticed working in the Pacific Islands a little bit is that every eight, eight agency is there. Everybody, you know, wants, of course, wants to do good. The problem, and this is the capacity problem, is, of course, if the UN, and often it's UNESCO, then it's UNDP, then it's the European Union has, you know, and human rights, everybody sends somebody to do something. And often because the problems are similar, you know, uh, the problems are established. Uh, if we think just about domestic violence, where actually ISMS did a, uh, the Institute did a, a project. There are many initiatives in, around domestic violence in Samoa, for example, because it's a known problem. The issue is, is with some of those projects that every aid agency comes in, every aid agency or funder has their own KPIs. And if you, and I don't know if you've ever experienced that yourself, but if you don't actually have any capacity and three people tell you in actual fact exactly the same thing, but do it slightly differently. Then, and you have no capacity, you not even know, you know that it's getting too hard because you can't take the step back and saying, actually, they're all telling me the same thing. Yeah, that because their KPIs are different, they're just telling me telling me in a different way. So the, so what's happened actually is that nothing happens because it's getting too hard because you're, you're faced with three different ways of you know addressing one problem and if there is no capacity that is in the too hard basket so that's definitely one big issue we're seeing and i think in the pacific and probably not only in the pacific but that's where where what i've um actually noticed noticed so we can we can i'm happy to talk about and anna i think will take over what we are trying trying to do here um uh, from the institute to address that problem the other thing, which is for the human rights lawyers among you, so one big issue in the Pacific, which is also not unique to the Pacific, but has actually is, has probably manifested itself quite uh, quite well, is the question of customs versus human rights. Um, so one other thing to know is, which I always think is quite funny, is that when many of those Pacific islands uh, got decolonized in the 60s, and there were English colonies. The English actually gave them gave them a, a written constitution with a human rights catalog in it, which was the Europe basically the European Convention of Human Rights. Given that it took the UK until 1998 to actually come up with the UK Human Rights Act, I find it always highly ironic. But um, so so. And then some of those constitutions, like in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, but to a certain degree also in um, Samoa and Vanuatu, actually it does talk about the role of custom as in, in regard and its relationship to the common law, for example, or it is stated as a constitutional principle. Tonga, who has a very early constitution, actually was never colonized, um, lacks any formal protection of custom. So they're just about to, there are a couple of decisions which seems to suggest a new, new, new developments that seem to suggest that that is on the rise. So that always has been, it always has been a tension here as, you know, is there a difference between custom and human rights? And if there is like a conflict, what, what will prevail? Um, so that actually in one sense, 
led to the Samoan constitutional crisis in 2020 and 2021, where the president said, oh, we, Samoa, you know, we have this constitution, which actually was, Samoa was also not as, de as differently decolonized than some other of the Pacific Islands. It was a huge input of the population and lots of basically a referendum and they gave themselves this human rights catalog and apparently that was then uh, to, to Western. And they went on to this quest to make Samoan more Samoan. Uh, that was not shared with, as it turns out, the majority of my uh, Samoans led to the first real opposition party in Samoa in 30, 40 years, and of course in the change of government. Um, but the issue here was really around, you know, cast, it, it played out in the custom and human rights space. In the end, um, they, they changed it back so that the Supreme Court does have the overall say of compliance of customary practices with the, with the human rights enshrined in the Constitution. But for a while, that wasn't quite happening. Now, one very interesting, and then I will stop, is actually um, a research project I did on the reception of the European Convention for obvious reasons in the in the Pacific, and that also then goes to this question of custom: is it really custom versus human rights, or are we not seeing you know custom as not static, um, like an adjustment or or a change. So I have, so overall to make this short is what was really interesting is that, you know, in 2018, 2019, if you look at it, the European Court of Human Rights was cited more in um, decisions of the Pacific Island courts than, than, than say the New Zealand New Zealand, New Zealand courts. Yeah, let's leave the Australians out because the Australians and their human rights this is, this is a completely different story. But you would have maybe expected them to uh, cite New Zealand quite regularly, since you know there is quite a good of exchange of judges in um, to the to the in the Pacific Islands. But surprisingly, there was a lot of citation of the European Convention of Human Rights, and I've put one of the decisions up where you actually can see where the majority and basically generally the, the supposedly contradiction actually plays out. And it basically says that as custom, yes, as long as it doesn't hit the core of a human right. I think that's the way I would uh, describe it. Yeah, and they have referred back often to the international covenants, um, but also then interpreting their own constitutions by referring back to the European Court of Human Rights. Now, I hand over to Anna, but I want to say because that's my last slide, but but I just, so I was quite happy when I, when I looked at it. And I thought, wow, that's actually really interesting, you know, and then it makes sense if you have the European Convention rights in your constitution to go back to look at what the European Court of Human Rights says in regard to the interpretation of those rights. And then, and this is what, this is just interesting on a very different level. And then I had a, had a seminar at Victoria on small states, and I had a student there who was actually working for our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I discussed that with the students. And then she said to me, you know, Petra, you know what? The European Union funded an entire project on rights compliance. And this is where this is coming from, because over a number of years, there was a lot of money and education poured into basically on human rights and the European Convention of Human Rights. And you can, I think that's a really interesting point also to realize and how aid works uh, and what it actually produces. Um, I don't think that in regard to the custom and human rights uh, sphere, it has it influenced too much, 
because the European Convention is flexible enough to take account, I mean, margin of appreciation of the different um, customs and cultures. However, the whole idea that you do an aid project to basically educate anybody, I mean, I think for me, it has a huge question mark. But um, yeah, so I hand over to Anna because she will, I think, talk about one of the projects and put that, what I just really quickly mapped out for you, into practice and giving you an example of one potential project. Okay, thank you, Petra, and um, Bula Vinaka, everybody. Uh, um, those of you who don't know, Petra is dialing in from New Zealand, uh, from the Pacific, and it's always a joy just to have, um, have a presentation with her. If you're online, I really apologize because I've got the audience in front of me and I've got my screen on the left hand side. So if you see me um, looking to the to my left hand side, it's not that I'm trying to avoid you. The screen is here. I've just got to make sure that the pace of my um, thought goes uh, along with the slide. Uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, in between and we'll try and make time for questions. Um, what I will talk about today is basically an initiative that the institution is going to roll out in the Pacific. And before we do this, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, who, from Fiji, who I spoke to in August uh, about this initiative and who uh, gave me really positive reception is the former acting DPP, uh, Ratu Deva Tomanival, who passed away uh, yesterday as well, who's a really good friend of mine. Uh, Sorry, I'm a bit emotional because of our relationship. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge uh, Litia from Fiji. If you could just wait, she flew in specifically. Uh, for these, those of you online, you can't see her, but she's a colleague from Fiji who also runs a, a private practice. Present today, I've also got my AGI colleague, uh, the AG uh, Fellows Program, if you can wave your hands as well. Uh, I've got um, our booklet here, for those of you that do not know about the program, please feel free to come and take the hard copies that I have here. Also, if you're online, please go to our website and we are a house uh, under HKU. Thank you so much, Kelly, for um, this opportunity. And I also want to acknowledge my two student ambassadors that are here and you get to meet them after. So back to the main reason why we're here. One of the initiatives that we're going to roll out in the Pacific is the Police De-Escalation and Mediation Training Initiative. Now, Petra has set um, the context of why we're introducing this training. She talked to you about our Pacific background. I want to discuss, apart from the issues and challenges she also said, is where to and how when it comes to de-escalation, human rights, and uh, the police training that we're going to do. Uh, just in addition to the two maps that she's already shown, and not that you've seen enough maps today, I just want to generally show the, in close context, not only the remoteness, but how the Pacific Islands, in terms of regionalism, has to work with each other when it comes to not only networking uh, police development programs, but also uh, other uh, human rights uh, initiatives that have to be rolled out. Now, a lot of uh, donor and aid agencies have rolled out and they specifically try and pick two countries from Micronesia, two countries from Polynesia or Melanesia. But this is our sub-regional uh, grouping, uh, linking back to our culture and our heritage uh, from uh, before the colonialism uh, came to be. So if you can see, I'm in the middle uh, there in Melanesia, between Melanesia and Polynesia. So Fiji and Tonga have a close relationship. I'll just point it out there. And Petra is here in New Zealand, dialing in. And we've got Polynesia and we've also, um, part of our heritage also includes Hawaii uh, in the US. And Micronesia uh, is really the Northern uh, Micronesia, has a lot of other rich cultures. and. Leading on from what Petra is talking about is I just wanted to show for you to give a, uh, for you to see a glimpse of population spread. Uh, Fiji, where I'm from, uh, less than a million people that are there as compared to uh, Tuvalu that Petra was talking about. This population uh, count was way back in 2020. So you've got 11,000 uh, people that are there uh, as compared to one, one to 300,000. And of course, Papua New Guinea, who's got over 8 million like uh, that's one of the largest uh, 
population in the Pacific, apart from Australia and obviously New Zealand, who are our, our neighbors. Uh, on this side are territories. So uh, these are territories that uh, come under the USA, France, uh, New Zealand and Australia have influence as well. I did my law degree in Vanuatu. So when I lived in Vanuatu, I was told, you know, the country is half British, half French. So you had a mixture of not only the mix of culture, but also the way people conducted things. And why it's important to have a glimpse of the mapping is also to show you how culture also influence the enforcement of rights and how the, relating the initiatives that we are doing uh, in be, bringing about peace building and restorative justice. So uh, Pacific regionalism is quite big. You know, those of you that have been looking at geopolitics, human rights, et cetera, et cetera. We are also hugely diverse with sub uh, regions, but as, uh, our culture and our geography is really rooted in our identity and our relational uh, relationship with each other from you know, the Melanesian Spearhead Group to the Pacific Islands Forum. You'll see lots of groupings in sub-regional and the Pacific region. And um, we normally like, when we see each other at conferences or even at, uh, at little gatherings, we kind of like can tell who's the Pacific Islander, so we just draw next to each other. And we start not only exchanging stories, but exchanging our identity. And that is all from just our root, uh, root in culture. Uh, geography, as Petra has already mentioned, you know, sometimes it takes a long distance to go from, say, Kiribati, you have to go via uh, Australia or via Fiji to go to their country, wherever you're coming from. From Samoa, you can have a direct flight from Samoa or Fiji or via New Zealand or Australia. There's always these main centers because of their remoteness and the travel. And sometimes tourism and agriculture, which is one of the major industries here, it's, you know, when people say, where are you from? And I say, Fiji, how long does it take? I said, oh, 10 and a half, uh, 10 and a half hours from Hong Kong. The first thing people do is this, whew, like that's such a long way to go. And so, um, you know, the remoteness and, and the distance also uh, plays a role in terms of enforcement and the impact of uh, rolling out that enforcement. Leadership historically and the gender issues historically in communities, it has always been patriarchal. The male, male has always been uh, historically majority of the countries in the Pacific has always been male dominated and decision-making where it comes to public policy and policy has also been male dominated. And that could also contribute to some of the enforcement in terms of uh, the UN agency um, reports, et cetera, et cetera. There's also been, lim uh, there is also limited resources and the priorities are based on not only the resources that are available, the biggest issue that's happening right now uh, is climate change talk that, you know, we here in Hong Kong, we're expecting a typhoon this weekend. And uh, in the Pacific, uh, cycle season, is always uh, issues of uh, when flooding comes in, NCDs and diseases, life expectancy, uh, all these other issues that we've had to deal with in terms of limited resources. When it also comes to law enforcement and human rights, technology also plays a role. I remember during COVID uh, issues of uh, when they had to move meetings online and even education. So even in a family, they had to share devices between two parents that are working and the children that are going to school. So even with technology and reaching people, that is also an issue when it comes to enforcing human rights and also making sure that equality is as important as equity when it comes to rights. Now, one of the initiatives that we are rolling out is, you know, most of the question is the question of why and the initiative and law enforcement challenges in the Pacific. Uh, the Pacific has a lot of technical skill issues, there's lack of technical uh, skills that are there, even with lawyers, you know, there's, um, in Fiji, we are blessed with a lot of lawyers, uh, but in some other remote countries, they might have less than 10 lawyers. In some jurisdictions, uh, they, uh, being a pra practicing barrister or practicing solicitor, it is combined, uh, whereas in the UK, you split it, in Australia, you can also split uh, the practices that are there. Uh, the Pacific needs are quite different in terms of different countries have different priorities and different needs. Some like Tuvalu, climate change is a big issue. I don't know if you had seen a couple months back, 
was the Minister of Foreign Affairs standing in the ocean uh, saying that, you know, while we're talking about sustainability and the 1.5 mark, the degree mark, some of us might not exist uh, if we don't meet the challenges that, uh, that you have committed to meeting. Uh, the AFP has rolled out the Pacific Police Development Program regionally. Uh, this, is, this initiative um, is really for police uh, to not only share technical knowledge, but also to try and share local knowledge when it comes to enforcing, when it comes to investigation, when it comes to also capacity development, as you have already heard uh, uh, Petra share. There's also priority areas that's directed by the uh, Pacific Island Chiefs of Police. They just had a conference in July where they talked and designed some operational uh, engagement and also development capabilities. Uh, the external partners that they're working with try and um, deliver on a regional, regional scale or mechanism to try and make sure that equity is also being practiced as well. Um, when we're talking about the, the, some of the challenges, uh, for example, in geography, when it comes to policing, some countries, because of the mountains and the isolation or the isolation because of the ocean as well, the policing is not enforced there. So the mechanisms that they use is culture and customs, which already is the roles that are set up traditionally. Uh, so that could be in the form of community leaders, of actual extended families, et cetera, et cetera. These alternative ways of policing on a cultural setting using customary law can also be a challenge when it comes to dignity uh, and peace building for people in the larger uh, islands. So sometimes the ratio of police to population is quite different when it comes to the remote areas as compared to the city. Uh, Litia, who's from Fiji, lives in one city. I live in the other city in Fiji. And we're quite uh, privileged to have not only enforcement, the human rights uh, commissioners are there. And in some countries, they use the ombudsman to deal with uh, internal police complaints, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm trying to say here is that while there's um, the initiative of the Pacific Police Development Program, Originally, this dispersing of advanced police, uh, policing and the capabilities is challenging depending on the country that you're looking at, the location that you're looking at, the resources that are available, the priorities that are there. And what we're trying to roll out uh, is an initiative that could use mediation, which is already part of the Pacific culture. Um, even petroleum, you know, those of you that can just see the wide ocean, this is the Pacific Ocean, you know, it takes one third of the world, patrolling around, looking after the EEZ and trying to make sure that, you know, drug issues are uh, uh, dealt with, uh, illegal activities are uh, uh, being looked after. It is definitely a challenge when you're looking at the issues that the Pacific has to deal with. Another issue that uh, law enforcement challenges, and it's everywhere in the world, you know, the work moment in America where they were all complaining about police brutality, about the way that police treat its community. I'm also a volunteer at the Los Angeles Dispute Resolution Office, and we use our mediation skills to bring about, uh, the to build a bridge between police and members of the community and using mediation and using peace building as a way of trying to also build with bringing, uh, treating people with dignity. So what really uh, we're doing is that with police, we're trying to uh, identify issues and interests. And it's a shift away of the system. Uh, you know, when you meet a police on the road, the first thing you do is, you know, you look at yourself you start wondering, you know, what, what's going to happen. And, you know, you start being conscious of if you were driving fast, guess what you'll do, you slow down, you'll look at the speedometer, or if there were other issues, you'll start, you'll start thinking about it. But what we're trying to do in this initiative is trying to identify the issues and interests and separating it so that any de-escalation that will happen has to deal with interest and emotion all in one while the police, police is actually dealing with members of the public. So actually the goal is, uh, there's been a study and it says that there's no one size that fits all. So the best practice is just 
to try and make sure that the mediators and the participants in the mediation process, uh, they're actually trying to come to an agreement. And so when we rolled out this training uh, with the Los Angeles police, one thing that we found that was a challenge for the police was actually trying to help the community reach a peace building resolution. They used to giving direction and telling you how to solve your problem. So this is a, a shift from using community policing to bring about peace and to make sure that they preserve the relationship amongst community leaders and the uh, members of the community themselves. Uh, it also, uh, the main issue is also to prevent violence or the escalation of violence, uh, promote problem solving, and also cooperation so that dealing with the capacity, the resources that are available, and also the priorities, this community policing mediation and de-escalation initiative uh, will really uh, improve and enforce human rights in general. So what, what would this type of training encompass? One thing that we're promoting is not bargaining over position, because sometimes when you are dealing with, uh, it's an interest-based approach. So the law enforcement officer will have to listen more and try and see, identify the issue and also separate the people from the problem. Because most of the time when people are angry and they're talking and they're discussing with each other, there really are hidden root problems and hidden issues. So the skills that we're introducing uh, in terms of peace building and restorative justice is to make sure that the hidden issues and the emotions are dealt with so that the person is separated from the problem. Otherwise, the normal, with gender-based violence, the, no, the normal you know, issues uh, in terms of people uh, are mixed together with the problem. The other options in terms of problem solving skills is options for mutual gain between all the parties, whether it's a neighbor, issue, whether it's um, a landlord and tenant issue, whether it's a father and daughter issue in terms of um, a dispute over the car or things like that in which the police are, the patrol police are coming in to solve, whether it's a school fight issue. Now, this is separate from the normal criminal system that will take uh, its own course. Also, what's interesting with this is the cross-culture awareness is that each person is more than a story. Uh, the cultural awareness in some cultures, you know, when you're talking to them, they don't look up. They look down because that's a, that's a sign of respect. In some cultures, the men do all the talking, the women keep quiet. Uh, this context is being taken into when trying to promote uh, not only problem solving skills, but de-escalation of issues. In some cultures, even the approach, the way that you are sitting cross-legged could mean that it's rude. Uh, and, and then some approaches is that, that they're not open-minded, you know, folding of arms. Uh, Kelly is laughing, that's me, <laughs> he ring a bell. Um, and so being culturally aware of where people come from, the values that they have, uh, being listened to is important because some, some problems just, or some issues and the de-escalation comes when they're just, when they are needed to be heard. So all of these cross-cultural awareness, uh, options for mutual gain really goes into the heart of mediating problems to, to reach a uh, resolution. I'm very conscious uh, of time and we'd like to have more uh, discussions on this. Um, we'll open up the floor now to question and answer. Okay, I think that's, I think we yeah, are, we are time. actually now. Thank now, you, Alta, I'm so of, sorry. Out of, out of time and I know, I. Realize, Petra, you, if you need to go, please um, feel free to, to log out now. Um, but first, please join me in thanking both of our. Um, these are not easy problems to resolve, um, but you both provided a lot of food for thought, I think. And I was one of my questions um, might the lessons from the perspective be applicable um, more broadly? And I think you've already answered that and provided a wealth of information. Um, I really like the point about ensuring um, trust building and starting with, the, with that sort of foundation. Incredibly important. So again, thank you all very much. Thank you both. Thank and you, thanks for joining us. Sorry, Elsa. We'll talk later. Join us uh, next week. We have another human rights seminar at exactly the same time on Tuesday in this room uh, focusing on the human rights situation in the Philippines. So please do come back. And so we'll have a third one also at the end of October and we'll have more information about those. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.